the Paul Leslie Interviews. Our guest on this episode of the Paul Leslie Hour is Natalie Goldberg. She's the author of The Great Spring, Writing, Zen, and This Zigzag Life, amongst many other books. I have to say, I've read your books, and I feel like I know you. <laughs> um, a lot of people say that, but, you know, that's good. It says my writing is intimate, and people feel close. But, you know, we never really know each other, and we never know an author, though we're dying to. I understand because... When I read things, all I want to do is know the author better. Hmm. Well, when people say things like that, when they when they say, uh, or when they feel a commonality with you, when they walk up to you and they want to shake your hand, how does that feel for you? It's good. It, it's sweet. You know, sometimes I'm in a good mood and it feels good. And sometimes I'm just cranky and want to be left alone. But what people don't realize is, is that they're reading one book, and many people have read my books, and sometimes I think they're disappointed that I don't get any more as much as they would like. I'm being totally honest. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, get their extreme pleasure from reading. And, of course, they always come up to me and say, I loved your book. And I say, which one? Of course, I know it's writing down the bones, but people don't realize I've written 16 books. And I have followed through with what I said in bones. I've continued to practice. So I, I want to say to people, if you want to really get a writer's attention, I'm being very ornery now, read the latest book by the writer. That's what they're interested in. But, of course, you know, I should shut up and be thankful. <laughs> you know, I know that, too. And sometimes someone carries on about bones so much that I actually go home and look at it again, thinking, what is in there? But, you know, for me, it was, you know, it's a long time ago, although I still completely practice what I said in that book. What's something that you used to care about that you no longer care about? Oh, my God, what a great question. It's really nice not to care about something anymore, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Actually, I was a poet for 13 years. I mean, madly in love with poetry, and I had two books of poetry published. And when I wrote Bones, I never wrote poetry again. I went right into prose. And that still amazes me that I let go of poetry. I mean, maybe I write two poems a year, and I always make sure to put them in my books somehow, slip them in. But, yeah, it amazes me I was able to let go. Something that I have observed about writers frequently, there's some type of, um, like, a, a combination of two great thoughts that seem to go through many, many writers, and that is, one... I hope that what I write lives on after I have passed away. And two, this frustration of, well, I'm going to pass away. What's the point? Uh-huh. What are your thoughts? Um, well, you know, what's the point of anything? I'm going to pass away. So how are you going to live your life? If you want to write, you should write. You know, we're going to pass away no matter what. So what do we want to do? So that takes care of the second one. You know, write if you want to write. Who cares if you pass away? Of course we're going to pass away. And then the first one, why bother? What was the first one? Oh, oh no, you want to hope that people read you after you're dead. Right. I frankly would like them to read me while I'm alive and can <laughs> enjoy it. <laughs> and can enjoy it and... People don't realize that the publishers look at numbers, and if the numbers are good, then they'll publish another book. So that's what I care about. Hmm. When I'm dead, I can't, you know, worry about it. Yeah, that's the truth. <laughs> yeah. How important do you think humor is if you're a writer? Not just a writer of humor, but just in general. Oh, I think it's really important. And I think people 
you know, intelligent people have senses of humor. You know, I studied with Allen Ginsberg in 1976 at the Naropa Institute at the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics. And he, someone came up to him and said, how do you get to teach at Naropa? And he said, write one great book or one funny poem. <laughs> and I think, you know, it's hard to write funny things, but it's really important to have a sense of humor and put it in your work. It's breathing space. Something about the subtitle, I really like that, Writing Zen in This Zigzag Life. So on the note of zigzag life, what was the particular inspiration behind that part? Well, it's funny. People have really responded to that word. Well, you know, our lives are not linear. A, B, C. You know, you can start out and want something a certain way, but life more unfolds than travels along the straight path. And I think zigzag really tells the truth of how life is and how you end up where you are. Most of us are surprised where we finally end up. We had no plans to be where we are now. What surprises you the most about where you are now? Oh, these are really good questions, but I, I, I want to think about it a little. What surprises me the most about where I am now? Well, actually, I'm surprised that I'm back in Santa Fe. I've lived, I've lived in Taos and Minneapolis and Ann Arbor, but I came to New Mexico originally from Santa Fe going to the St. John's The Great Book School. But I never expected to stay in Santa Fe. I like it, but I'm not in love with it, like I was with the Twin Cities and Taos. But it fits me really well. And maybe one of the things that surprises me about Santa Fe, I write really well here. What is it about Santa Fe that you think is conducive to writing? You know, I have no idea. Well, yes, I do. I'm in walking distance from town, and I like to be able to walk places. And I think people respect and honor my success and also leave me alone and, you know, are just friendly. And, of course, it's beautiful beyond beautiful. But you don't need beauty to write. You need determination and practice. Pick up that pen. Determination and practice. Hmm. What would you say is the biggest obstacle, if there is any, for you as a writer? Well, you know, I've been practicing a long time <laughs> and studying the human mind. So even when I'm resistant, I understand it. So it doesn't toss me away. You know, I don't not write for six years. But what is still... Difficult. Is that what you asked? Was difficult still as a writer? Yeah. What's um, the what, if any, is the obstacle that you face? Yeah. I think sometimes when I'm not writing, believing that it's important, and that's um, and that really isn't me. It's the voices probably of my family, of why bother? Because I don't feel that way. I deeply love to write, and it you know it's hard you know it, to in order to write, you have to be willing to be disturbed but um I think it's the voices that we're brought up with, you know why are you doing it? Oh, another book, come on, Natalie, nobody's interested, so in a way, I'm negating everything I said at the beginning that you asked me, <laughs> but yeah it it's hard to to believe it again when I'm not writing. If I don't write for a while, I believe those voices. And then I catch myself because really I need to write. Otherwise I have this crazy mind with no discipline. Getting back to the book, The Great Spring, Writing Zen in This Zigzag Life, 
when I was reading it, that one of the things that I like is the number of places that you take us. You start off and you take us to Japan. Tell the listeners out there a little bit about your experience in Japan. What goes through your mind the most when you think about what you experienced there? Oh, well, if you're referring to the Great Spring, because I'm writing a new book about Japan right now, but if you're referring to the Great Spring, I think what surprised me the most is how modern Japan was. And I went there as a kick-ass Zen practitioner. And I think I was looking for 16th century Japan, you know, where everybody was practicing and it was tough. And, um, you know, they had samurais, maybe... I don't know, did they have them in 16th century? Anyway, I was naive. I was looking for ancient Japan. And, you know, Japan has become very modern and is not very interested in Zen. Zen is used now for funerals more than anything else. The practice of, or the the pursuit of Zen, what would you say is the commonality of people who are looking for this? Oh, that's a good question. Gee, you are good. I think there's something broken in us, and we recognize it. And we're looking for some kind of truth that isn't being spoken in our society. Hmm. There was a friend of mine not long ago, and he was saying, you know, people have suggested to me things like meditation as something to soothe me and as something to find relief from some of this pain that I have. And then he said, but that's not for me because my brain just works differently. What would you respond to that? Well, is is he OCD or any of those things? Because they do work, di- work differently. Or is he just an ordinary person? I would say he's an ordinary person. Oh, okay then I'd say your brain probably doesn't work differently, but find a practice that suits you. If meditation isn't quite right, then find, you know, you could do writing practice. You could do running practice. There are many walking practice. Really, you can pick up something and make it a practice. Cooking practice. But also, tell him not to use that idea that he's more messed up than everyone else. We're, we all have the same principles of mind. Hmm. I'd have to hear, speak to him specifically and hear why he thinks his is so special. What you just said the, about tell him that he's not as messed up as everyone else, that is something I have heard so many people say about themselves, and it's something that I have said about myself as well. Is that- yeah, it's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, finally, what it is is you're believing monkey mind too much. That constant chatter, discursive thinking, it's not really the depth of our life. Hmm. Another thing in the book, you talk about the pilgrimages to Bob Dylan's birthplace in Minnesota. Yeah, I love Dylan. Why? Oh, my God. He's like the Shakespeare of our time. And I'm so thrilled that the Nobel Prize went to him this year. I mean, he is an extraordinary writer. Absolutely. I mean, he's caught our generation. He's caught the country. Is there a song from Bob Dylan that resonates with you the most? Um... Well, there's so many, but one I literally listen to over and over again, driving from Minnesota to New Mexico, what is trying to get to heaven before they close the doors. It's on a Time Out of Mind album. Do they call them albums anymore? I do. Okay, good. <laughs> and I was born in the 80s, so... <laughs> oh, okay, good. Yes, so you're albums. a good test. <laughs> Well, I was hoping you could speak with us a little bit about the film that you made, Tangled Up in Bob. Yeah, well, it was a film that I made with the filmmaker Mary Fight, 
It was one of the most fun things I've ever done. We went up to Hibbing, Minnesota many times. I wanted to understand. Dylan wrote some of his best songs when he was 21. And from six years old till 18, he lived in Hibbing, Minnesota. So you know Hibbing had an influence on him. So I went up there. I wanted to explore his childhood. And it was amazing. He's the only one that left Hibbing. His English teacher is still there, his best friend, the house he lived in. It's all still there. So I, we went and interviewed a lot of people and, you know, and did a film. I was searching for Bob Dylan. It was, it's called Tangled Up in Bob and it's an hour long documentary. I'm in it. She sort of follows me, the filmmaker, searching for Bob Dylan. It ended up that Bob Dylan had the most extraordinary English teacher at Hibbing High School. And so the film almost became more about my relationship with this English teacher who really admired Bob and, you know, loved what he was doing because a lot of people in Hibbing hate him. Really? Oh, yeah. Are you kidding? They partially hate him. It's a small town. They partially hate him because he left. You don't leave. And also, you know, the prophets in their own town don't recognize them. We're joined by author Natalie Goldberg. What is the best compliment you've ever received as an author? <laughs> you know, I've been writing for a lot for 45 years. So I don't know, my goodness. <laughs> well, I love when they say people say that they like my writing and that I'm detailed, and that I know place, and that I sometimes have interesting structures. That really I like. But often people come up to me and probably other authors and just tell them how books affected them, which is okay, but if you want to get the, right, the author's attention, talk about the actual work. Yeah. See, I'm trying to train these, train your listeners. <laughs> <laughs> what is the best advice you can give to someone who is trying to write? Shut up and pick up the pen. <laughs> Go. No nonsense. Don't tell me you have a different mind than everyone else. Just shut up and go. Ten minutes. Keep your hand moving. Sorry to be so austere, <laughs> but that's the truth. You want to write? Write. If you want to diet, you don't read books about dieting. You stop eating so much food. <laughs> if you want to run, you have to run. Yeah. Something that I find that happens to me a lot when I'm writing a blog post, for example, it starts off with incredible passion, and then somewhere towards the end, it starts to just kind of flounder a little bit. What do you think is the best solution for a writer, whatever they're writing, when they start to feel themselves losing the energy? Well, there are two things. One, and this is the thing I think I would recommend more, is when you're floundering, keep the hand moving. Because sometimes, you know, you're taking a little rest or your psyche is searching for something, and then keep moving beyond where you're floundering. And also, I think, don't stay on the subject so long. If you stay on the subject too long, everyone gets bored, including you. That's why you're floundering. So jump around. Grab something else. Look up for a minute. Doorknob. Throw a doorknob in. <laughs> Throw a doorknob in. I like that. <laughs> That's probably going to be what I think of from now on when I find that happening. Yeah. Don't try to stay on the subject. We were taught incorrectly in the public schools that, you know, you just stay on a subject. That isn't how the mind moves. So you're saying allow the mind to go where it will. Yeah, because it has its own integrity if you step out of the way 
and let writing do writing and stop trying to control it. Find out what your real voice is. Get out of the way. How do you think is the best way for a writer to find his voice? I don't really worry about that that much. Just write. <laughs> That's how you find everything. Fill notebooks and you'll find your voice. And your voice is no different than your ordinary way of talking. What is the best thing about being Natalie Goldberg? Dropping Natalie Goldberg. Explain a little more. Dropping me, you know, um, the old yellow coat of myself and my ideas and who people think I am and just being present moment by moment. When you're present moment by a moment, you're not anybody. If you had to define who you are, what would you say? A writer, a Zen practitioner, a Jew, a lover of nature, a woman, a feminist. I think that's it. I mean, I could think of more, but a gardener. Lover to eat. I love to eat. Love to travel. Anyone who's out there who wants more information, they can visit the website. It's nataliegoldberg.com. I want to thank you so much for sharing with us. This was wonderful. You asked wonderful questions. And please don't don't feel badly if I don't remember you. <laughs> I, I won't. <laughs> okay. You know, I tell people... If they meet me, you know, again and stuff, to please introduce themselves again, and sometimes it comes back. But, you know, it's it's too many for me to hold. I try not to connect my ego too much with things like that. But you really do ask great questions. That's true. I really, really appreciate it. It was really fun, and anytime you want to interview me. I have a, a new book coming out in June. If you want to do an interview then, that's great. I would love it. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, just connect with John Spaulding, who's very responsive, as you could see. Wonderful. Yes, indeed. Okay. Thanks. So do you live in L.A.? No. I'm oh. in Atlanta. <laughs> oh. Is that where it's going to be aired? There and in Charleston, South Carolina. And also, I'm launching a podcast on... The 2nd of September, so this will be included there as well. Oh, okay. I love, I go to Atlanta, I've been to Atlanta a lot, and last time I was there was in April, and I went to Columbus, Georgia, to Carson McCullers' 100th anniversary. Okay. Yeah, and I, um, Charleston, I've taught there. I love the South. I've written about it a bunch, particularly in a book called Thunder and Lightning. You have great writers in the South. That's absolutely true. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. And I don't know, you probably don't know him, Bill Addison. He was the food critic for Atlanta Magazine. Bill Addison. But, and now he's for Eater.com. He's getting really big. I definitely know about Eater.com. <laughs> yeah, and he, well, he's he was one of my students, and he wrote the introduction to the 30th anniversary of Bones because writing practice taught him how to become a food critic. He had no experience. I have to ask this question now that you Absolutely. bring that up. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> what is the best meal you've ever had? Oh, now we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm ashamed to say, as Bill says, I'm very old-fashioned. My favorite meals were in the Carnegie Dell in New York City, you know, the and a corned beef sandwich that was a mile high. And oh, yeah. I was such a pig. After I ate that, then I'd order blintzes. Nice. Cheese blintzes. See, the problem is that I live out west, and there's nothing like a Carnegie Dell. So when I get to New York, I just gouge. <laughs> Unfortunately, it just closed, and it yeah. broke my heart. It really broke my heart. There's nothing like a great meal. 
I know. <laughs> I know. Well, keep your eyes open for Bill Addison. He's a terrific writer. He just won a James Beard Award for one of his essays. All right. Bill Addison. Yeah. I wanted to say hello to our friends at KPFK, Roy of Hollywood and the Something's Happening show. He was one of the people who encouraged me to do an interview with you. Uh-huh. Well, in closing, for our listeners out there, I would just give you the microphone. What would you say to anyone who's tuned in? Oh, I'd say hi. <laughs> you know, there are a few more weeks of summer. Even though people think fall is happening, we still have till September 21st. Please enjoy it. Stop for a moment in your suffering and your pain and get a popsicle. Get a popsicle or look up at the sky. Just stop for a moment and allow the world to come home to you. Well spoken. Thank you so much. It was just a pleasure. It was a pleasure for me, too. I look forward to the next time. Me, too. Me, too. Thank you. All right. Happy trails. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.